subject than we can, of course, cover in, in one message. But, uh, you know, the Lord gives us patterns in the Scripture. If you want to understand about life and eternity, uh, listen, this is the book where you've got to go. You'll see the patterns uh, that, that God gives. And, uh, you know, we can see in, in God's Word how sin develops. Uh, we can see how to follow the Lord. But when we talk about moral freedom, we're not talking about the freedom to do what we want. We're talking about the, the freedom and the power to do what we ought. You know, that's a, that's a difficult thing. Uh, Paul talked about how, you know, the things he didn't want to do, he found himself doing. And the things he wanted to do, he found it so hard to do. Uh, it, it's hard. But God can give us the power and the freedom to, uh, to live for him. You know, right after creation, one of the patterns you see is, was the fall. And then, of course, man went into sin and you know, God brings the flood and uh, then you know, God begins the process of, of redemption right from the beginning there. Uh, we see the patterns in, in God's word. And as we read in Genesis chapter 3, just be aware that uh, Revelation 12, 9 tells us that this serpent is, this, is Satan. This is not just a, a snake. Uh, this is Satan, that, that old serpent, the devil, it calls him in, in Revelation 12, 9. Let me read, uh, starting here in uh, Genesis chapter 3. Actually, before, we're, we're going to have a... Just a little diagram. It's, it's on your, your sheet there as well. But, uh, you know, the, the standard that God has, the, the gold standard, is that the spiritual is the most important. You, you know, you think about when we talk about, as human beings, a th being a three-part person, what's the way we almost always list it? Body, soul, and spirit. And that's exactly upside down. <laughs> you know, uh, God's standard is the most important part is the spiritual and then the the soul and then uh, then the physical your soul is your mind your will and, and emotions and so on as we look here in, in Genesis chapter 3 we'll see that even though man was made in the image of God even though he was born and made with the capability not to sin uh, they yielded to temptation and we begin to see this uh, this pattern of sin's downward spiral Genesis 3, starting in verse 1. Now, the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the, tree, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together, and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree? Whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldst not eat? And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go. And thus shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. 
Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. And Adam called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. We just stop reading there. Uh, God's standard, and yet you see how, how soon and how quickly uh, they started that downward spiral. Uh, you know, it starts, it, you can fill in the blanks there on your, on your sheets or, or not. It starts with a natural curiosity. You know, God made us to be curious people, uh, to, to think about things, to wonder about things. But he, he did give us a restriction. Uh, it's found in Romans 16 and, and verse 19 when he says that God wants us wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil. See, our, our curiosity, our, uh, God restricts it in the area of evil. The way he wants us to know about evil is not by experience. It's by seeing what's foreign to what's right. God wants us to know what's right and to, and to be able to say, that's not right. You know, sometimes you don't even know why something's not right. But you know it's not right because you know what right is. Uh, it starts with a natural curiosity. Then you see the awakening of conscience. As they, as they begin to look, as they begin to think, uh, at she, I should say, um, and the, the question comes to mind, are you sure this is right? You know, we, uh, we get a, uh, our conscience gets, gets pricked. God has built, has built in an alarm system for us. And as human beings, uh, there's times when we override it. Uh, we don't listen to, that, to that, our conscience. And Eve then, the third thing was a sensual focus. Sensual focus. You know, there's a lot of things in life now that are, are based, based on this. Uh, many of the uh, advertise, well, I guess all of the advertisements are trying to approach us on the sensual level. Uh, you, what you have is not good enough. You need something different. In Genesis chapter 3, uh, you know, the, uh, in verse uh, 6, the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise. Uh, she had a she took a sensual focus, a focus on the physical rather than on God and on the spiritual. And then, as well, began to question Scripture. Now, it wasn't so much her at this point as it was Satan as he presented it. You know, very bold, isn't he? Satan doesn't apologize for trying to get us to sin. In verse 1, yea, hath God said? Did, did God really say that? And then in just getting her to, uh, to quote it, he, he is trying to make her, her doubt. You, you probably had that happen where somebody asks you about something, you think, now, is that really how it was? Uh, even though before they ask, you, you knew. Uh, begin to question Scripture. You know, in verse 4 and 5, the, the serpent just basically calls God a liar. Ye shall not surely die. And then he, he tells the, the woman that what God is trying to do is hold back on them. And, you know, that's, that's sin's approach. That's... Satan hasn't changed his tune. Uh, he wants us to have a sensual focus and to uh, question Scripture and to think that if we follow Scripture, we're going to miss out on all the, the really good things in life. It's like somebody wrote a book or something called, Why Should the Devil Have All the Good Music? And, and you think, you know, what an attitude to think that that rotten music that many times the world has is what we need to make us happy. And that's exactly the approach that Satan was taking with, with, with Eve there. And then, of course, uh, she violated her conscience. The end of verse 6, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. A violation of conscience. And, of course, at that point, we've all experienced it, awakening of guilt. You know, you, you consider, your conscience is pricked, you override it, you do the wrong thing, and then you feel guilty. That's a good thing. Uh, but Adam or Eve at this point, and then Adam as well, uh, their response to temptation is not the right one. We're all going to be tempted, uh, but we need to have a different response uh, than what they had. And the Bible says that they then, at that point, began to be separated from God. Uh, they tried to hide themselves in uh, verse 8. Uh, later on, verses 23 and 24, God actually puts them out of the garden uh, because of their sin.
And you know, that's, that's the way sin is. I, I sometimes think of it like a, the bait on the hook. You know, as a fisherman, you don't want the fish to think about the hook. You want them to think about the bait. And that's the way Satan tempts us. Uh, you know, he, he attacks us at our, our conscience. In James, he gives us pretty much the same pattern. James 1, verses 14 and 15. Every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then, when lust hath conceived, isn't that a picture? You know, lust conceives, boom, the baby's out. It bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it's finished, bringeth forth death. You know, we don't think of that when we're in the, in the throes of, of temptation. Um, God's standard is that we focus on the spiritual. S Satan and self, flesh, wants us to focus on, on the physical. Go ahead and put up that second picture, if you would, Azrael. And the, the problem then, when we switch things around, uh, the Bible uses a big word called concupiscence. It's when we're, we have a sensual focus. The physical becomes the more important. Uh, then the psychological and the spiritual becomes subservient to, to all of those. You know, a wrong response to temptation we see in Genesis chapter 3. Now we see in their lives a wrong response to guilt. And we've all been there. We've all been tempted. We've all done the wrong thing and, and had guilt. But you know, it's very simple what our response to guilt should be. What, what does God tell us to do when we're guilty? Yeah, confess. Agree with God. If we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sin. But instead of doing that, uh, many times what we have is incomplete repentance. You know, a lot of times in life we're sorry for the consequences of our sin, but we're not actually sorry for our sin. I've, I've been there, you've been there, we've seen people like that. Uh, the Bible says in Proverbs 8, 13, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. We, we've talked quite a bit lately, especially on Wednesday nights, about the fear of the Lord. And here's a definition. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. And, and it's not the consequence that should bother us as much as the sin, the sin against God. Uh, the problem with re repentance over consequences is that it gives us a secret envy of those who get away with it. You know, we, we think others, oh man, they're, they're getting away with it. They're enjoying the pleasures of sin. Oh, poor me, I got caught. Uh, you know, we, we need to have complete repentance, not just sorry for the consequences, but sorry uh, for our sin against God. And it leads us oftentimes to compensate, religious compensation. Uh, you know, there's people who get involved in religious activity. Uh, they get involved in humanitarian activities uh, to try and salve their conscience. You see the, the reaction of Adam and Eve, and it, it, if, if it wasn't such an awful situation, you'd laugh. They sewed fig leaves together. Can you imagine? <laughs> Sewing fig leaves together to try and cover themselves. Uh, and yet that's no more ridiculous than what many people do to try and say that they're okay before God. And of course, that leads to frustration. You know, when, when there's no solution for our sin, and we're dealing with guilt, and, and it, it's a constant cycle, uh, there's a terrible frustration. This is why and this is when many youth drop out of, of Christian circles. You know, they, they, they come to church, they go along till they're maybe 7th, 8th grade, ninth grade, uh, but because of their sin, because of their incomplete repentance, uh, they just tire of the, the frustration. And I talk to people all the time, adults, who as a child decided... Not for me, because they never really knew the forgiveness of the Lord and understood the, the peace that, that Jesus brings. Uh, you know, there's, there's people who, who try to compensate, but their sensual desires and their sensual actions uh, continue. And, and sometimes they blame others. Did you notice, um, who was it he talked to first? The, the man, the woman. She, it's her fault. The woman blames the snake. The only one who didn't blame somebody was, was Satan. He's happy to take the responsibility, I guess. I don't know. doesn't tell us. Uh, but, you know, that's a, a common thing. We blame someone else. Uh, who do we blame? Man, it's parents cop it, don't they? Uh, sometimes it's the church. Uh, sometimes it's, it's other things. We, we blame others for... Uh, there's been times when it's been really popular to blame demons. Oh, you know, the, the devil made me do it. Or demon uh, influence and so on. And at that point... Uh, 
many people begin to re-examine the scriptures, if, if they're interested in scriptures at all. Uh, they begin to justify their immorality, uh, redefining their moral convictions. Uh, I've lived long enough now to see this cycle in people's lives, where, where they, they come along, they're serving the Lord, and then pretty soon things begin to change. They begin to redefine sin. They begin to redefine what is normal Christian activity and so on. In uh, 2 Peter chapter 2 and verses 1 and 2, he talks about false prophets. Now this, isn't, this cycle is not just about false prophets, but this attitude. Uh, he says there will be false teachers who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, uh, redefining scripture, you know, making up their own truths even denying the Lord that bought them. You know, you know, there's people who are in churches, so-called Christian churches, who don't even believe that Jesus is Lord, who don't believe that he's the Son of God. Isn't that amazing? I've, I've often wondered what people preach at churches where they don't preach the Bible. Anyway, denying the Lord that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction, and many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. You know, it's a common thing to begin to justify immorality and redefine their moral convictions. Well, it's not really sin. And, of course, that, that brings them to a place where they're arguing over Scripture and doctrine. You, know, you meet people and you wonder why they care. But a lot of times the reason they're so against Christianity or they're so against uh, just a literal understanding of Scripture is because they've considered it. They've tried to live it, but they've not lived it in the power of the Holy Spirit. They've not trusted Christ as their Savior. So they have, to, they have to deny it. They have to redefine it. And it makes them very argumentative. I think I mentioned talking to a guy the other day. He didn't believe in God. He believed in, uh, what's it called when you inject the babies? Uh, you know, immunization. immunization. Boy, he was hot on immunization. Everybody should immunize. Or, or no, he, he was the opposite. He, he believed you shouldn't immunize. And, and I, when, I told, when he told me he didn't believe in God, I said, well, why do you care? <laughs> what difference does it make? Immunize, don't immunize. Uh, you know, if you don't believe in God, what, what difference do all, all these things make? But you see, I'm, I'm pretty sure somewhere down the line, he's considered Christ. And his life hasn't matched up, and he's not dealt with it with repentance. He's dealt with it in his own way and tried to compensate. Uh, oftentimes, these are people who are religious, but ignore the Bible. Uh, some, sometimes, these are people who don't believe in God. But you know, when people don't believe in God, it's not an intellectual problem. It's a moral problem. And, and be, be kind to people, in a sense, when they don't believe in God. Bring them to their conscience. Don't try, you know, we don't have to argue all the things out scientifically. That's not, that's not why they're evolutionists. It's because of their heart. And, and we need to, to bring them to the Lord and bring them to what they are before God. In uh, Titus chapter 3, uh, he says, A man that's an heretic after the first and second admonition reject, knowing that he that is such is subverted and sinneth, being condemned of himself. That's not that in our church. We don't accept them, you know, if they're teaching heresy as part of our church, but we do want to reach their, their heart. Uh, moral problems. Uh, they couldn't handle the terrible guilt. And let me tell you, God doesn't want you to handle guilt. We need to understand that. God doesn't want us to handle guilt. Yeah, the world will give you pills. It'll give you all kinds. Of, they've got all kinds of ways to, to deal with guilt. But it doesn't really deal with the problem. See, the reason we feel guilty is because we're sinners. It's when we do wrong. Right, God is the one who will handle your guilt. You hand it over to him. In uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6, the, uh, the book that we're, we're going through on Sundays, verse 3, he says, if any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he's proud, knowing nothing but doting about questions and strifes of words. I've often thought, uh, there's people who like to try and destroy us, what we believe, by their questions. But you stop and ask them, they don't have answers. All they've got is questions. Whereof come, cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness, from such uh, withdraw thyself. Uh, they, they compensate, they rationalize. Go ahead and put up that, that third picture. 
And you know, it brings them uh, to a place of, the Bible uses the term being a reprobate. They just reject all standards. And you see that commonly in society. It's nothing new. It's not just new to our generation. But they just leave off the spiritual. They say there is no, no spiritual side to life. You know, Adam and Eve did what, uh, where this pattern leads to, they ran away. You know, that's, that's people's solution many times to problems. Have you ever known somebody like that? Anytime something tough came up, they ran away. Um, I've, I've known people like that. I've, I've been a person like that at times. And, uh, you know, in, in Genesis chapter 3 and, and verse 8, they, they hid. What, what a silly thing to think we can hide from God. And Adam and Eve would have, would have known that. Uh, they thought that they could, they could hide from God. And the problem with this is it follows incomplete repentance. And you know, as, as Christians, we understand the pattern. Uh, that doesn't just affect us. It doesn't just affect me as an individual. Uh, that will affect the people that know me. It'll affect the next generation. Uh, you know, it can affect a whole nation. If you've read through the Old Testament, you'll see nations where they go away from God. Why? Because the leader, way back here, decided they could live in sin and, and get, away, get away with it. Uh, what a terrible thing. Uh, they deny that sin exists. They deny that God exists. But you know, God offers us moral freedom. This is a wonderful thing. God offers us moral freedom. I, I mentioned at the beginning, it, it's not the freedom to do what you want. It's the freedom to do what you should. To do what God wants you to do. You know, you could take any object, just about, and it usually has a purpose. Uh, you know, I, I've got a shoe. I usually put it on my foot. I can do other things with it. We've probably all driven a nail with a shoe at one point or one time or another. But you know, God has a purpose for us. Uh, follow that illustration. If we're a shoe, quit, quit driving nails with your life and start being a shoe. You know, God has a purpose. He, he wants us to be free to be what he intends for us. Not what the world says. You, you know, the devil doesn't love you. The world doesn't love you. God loves you. The world will get you away from God's pattern, and then they'll abandon you. I mean, you see the world's pattern. Drink, drink, drink. But if you become a drunk, oh, go see those religious people. They'll, they'll look after you. <laughs> you know, it's true, isn't it? That's the pattern. Uh, Satan lures you along, then he abandons you. Uh, we need to have God's freedom. And the Bible says that comes from complete repentance. If you're on the other, uh, well... I think it's on the other side of your notes there. Um, could be wrong on that. No, it's still, still on the first, first side. Uh, identify the real cause of sin. You know, we, we have a lot of groups, uh, philosophies, that try and explain sin away from a heart that's wicked. You know, like I mentioned, a lot of times we blame our parents or we blame um, physical things and, and so on. But we need to identify the real cause of sin. And you come right down to it, it's that we want to be God instead of God being God. We want to be the boss instead of him being the Lord. And that's what Satan was, was tempting them with. Hath God said? God just knows that if you eat of this, you'll be like God. And really, that's, that's what, what people want when they reject the Lord. Uh, Lord means boss. Uh, when we don't repent, it's because we've dethroned God. God is the one on the throne. Secondly, realize the consequences of sin to God. Do you ever think about that? Uh, Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 53 many years before the crucifixion, describes it and describes some of the cost to the Lord of, of our sin. Isaiah 53, verse 3, He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. You know, sin cost 
God. God was manifest in the flesh. And the reason he did, the Bible talks about the lamb slain from the foundations of the world. Maybe it says before the foundations, I think it does. Uh, Jesus came knowing why he came. God created us knowing we'd sin. And yet he loved us that much. It cost God to invest in us, uh, to have the fellowship that, uh, that we can have with the Lord. Realize the consequences of sin to God and agree with God. You know, confessing, when the Bible says if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sin. Confessing is just to agree with God. God says, you're a sinner. Confession says, yes, I am. Isaiah 55 and, and uh, verse 7, he says, Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. In Psalm 38 and uh, verse 18, we find that. I will declare mine iniquity. I will be sorry for my sin. You know, the publican in the New Testament said, God be merciful to me, a sinner. Now, even the prodigal in, in Jesus' story, now, I've, I've sinned against heaven. Now, he saw his sin. Now, you know, if we excuse sin or we try to earn forgiveness, we're not really agreeing with God, are we? And many times, you know, we can, we can be confronted by our sin and sometimes we just think we can push it away, we can ignore it, but every time it, it hurts our, our conscience, it hurts our relationship with the Lord. Every sin proves that God's word is accurate. It's an amazing thing, isn't it? Every sin that we commit, it just proves that God's word is accurate. Now, Jeremiah wrote it this way in Jeremiah 17 and, and verse 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? In Romans 3.10, he says, As it is written, there is none righteous. No, not one. Yet, I'll, I'll challenge you. you. You ask people about their goodness. And you know, most of us declare our goodness. But is God convinced? Uh, we need real repentance, complete repentance before God. Repentance is to turn from sin and self to God. And then we need to let the Lord rebuild us. Uh, this is where you, on the back of your sheet there, uh, we need to learn to hate evil. Now, the danger here, the, the problem is, we don't want to focus on our sin. Uh, we don't want to focus our life on, on sin, but we do need to hate evil. Uh, the Bible says that the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. The verse we read in, in Proverbs. One of the things, some of the things you can do is to minimize the benefits of evil. You, you'll probably remember the verse where it talks about Moses. You know, Moses had a choice. He was in the most powerful nation in the world at that time, in Egypt. He had a choice. He could go with Egypt. He was part of the leadership. Or he could go with the Lord's people. You know what? The choice is the same today. Stop and think about what Moses was facing. Scroll forward a few years. <coughs> Egypt is no longer the most powerful nation in the world. Its army's been destroyed. Uh, its people have been humbled. Uh, you know, things can change pretty quickly, can't they? Now, you can identify with the world, but I'll guarantee you, the Bible says in, in Hebrews 11, verse 25, esteeming the, uh, um, get the right verse, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Sin's pleasure only lasts for a season. It doesn't last long. Egypt didn't last long. We were talking today, saying, boy, I wouldn't want to visit Egypt. <laughs> yeah, oh, I'm scared to go there. They, they kill tourists there. Uh, no, I don't know. You know, there's probably, I'm sure there's some good things there. They make good sheets there. Um, but we need to learn to minimize the benefits of, of evil. Uh, we can identify with the world, but listen, it won't last. It won't last. Moses chose to suffer affliction with the people of God. And he's a prime person in history because of his choice you know there's not many people in the world that know anything about history that don't know about Moses God used him secondly magnify the consequences of evil minimize the benefits 
magnify the, the consequences of evil. We need to understand the harm that evil does. And like I said, we don't want to focus our life on, on evil, but we just need to have an understanding. Uh, there, there's, there's no benefit to it. In Exodus chapter 34 and, and verse 7, the last part of the verse, he says, visiting the iniquity of the, of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and to the fourth generations. You just think of that. You know, we, we think of sin as something personal. But listen, the Bible says, be sure your sin will find you out. And you know, it doesn't just affect us. It affects our children. It affects our grandchildren. It affects our great-grandchildren. Uh, someone did a, a, a study of two families in America. One of them was a wicked man. He cost the government millions because most of his offspring spent their time in prison. The other man was a godly man. He didn't cost the government anything. They were lawyers and doctors and governors. and They were people that, that paid their taxes and, and, and did good things. What you do has, has a result. We need to understand the, the, the consequences of sin. And the Bible says in Romans 13 verse 14, Make not provision for the flesh. Now, I should have come up with a, a really good illustration of this, but uh, he says, Put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. I think you know what I'm talking about. Where you just put something in place where it's going to be a little bit easier to give in to sin. You, you just don't quite deal with it fully so that if you change your mind, it'll... It'll work out. Uh, be careful. Don't make provision for the flesh. And the Bible starts that verse, put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ. Make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Let me give you a good test of whether you hate sin or not. If you really hate sin, you're going to be able to love the sinner. If you don't really hate sin, you're not going to be able to love the sinner. You know, I've met people who hate sinners. It's because they, they don't really hate sin themselves. They haven't really dealt with it themselves. That's a good test. The more you hate sin, the more you'll be able to love the sinner. Because you'll, you'll understand what they, what's got a hold of them. You know, where they're headed. Uh, what it's like for them. The, the terrors of sin. Just, just living with it. Uh, just watching a, an interview today. I, you know, sometimes you watch things, your heart just goes out to people. You think they, they just need the truth. You know, people struggle through their lives. They're so unhappy with, and this was a very successful Olympic athlete. So unhappy. You think all they need is the truth. You know, emphasizing the physical. And I don't know where she is on, on, on these charts, but, you know, emphasizing the physical to the, uh, and leaving off the spiritual. When the physical, really, that's not what's going to make the difference in eternity. And it won't even make the difference in this life, let alone eternity. It's the spiritual, it's the eternal that makes the difference. There's a picture there on, on your, your notes there, talking about some things. And like I said, we, we, we can't cover everything tonight, but uh, rebuilding to God's pattern. Rebuilding to God's pattern. That's what God wants us to do. We can see the pattern of sin. You know, if we're wise, we'll just read God's word and we'll see. You know, there comes temptation. Well, what are we going to do with temptation? If we give in, what are we going to do with guilt? <laughs> you know, and God tells us what to do with those things. And as Christians, we want to rebuild our thoughts and our lives to God's pattern. And God's pattern is Jesus. That's what he wants in our lives, to be like Jesus. And uh, number one in, on that picture there is, is basically that each wrong thought or problem is an opportunity to grow in, in faith. Uh, don't resent temptations necessarily. Uh, it's an opportunity to trust the Lord. It's an opportunity to obey the Lord. Learn to turn your thoughts into discussions with God. Uh, the real temptation is not the wrong thought, but the desire to determine which thoughts we'll share with God. Which thoughts we're going to, when we're going to obey, obey the Lord. Each wrong thought or problem is an opportunity to grow in faith. Let me read to you from, from James chapter 1. You probably know these verses almost by heart. James 1 verse 2. My brethren, here's a strange statement. 
Count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. See, that's what we're saying. Uh, don't just fear the temptation. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, which giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given, given him. But let him ask in faith. See, temptation is not the problem. You know, we can't stop the birds flying over our head. We can't stop them building a nest in our hair. You know, temptation is, is going to come. Uh, each wrong thought or problem is an opportunity to grow in faith. Share everything with God in prayer. Secondly, expose each thought to God's word. Now, to do that, you're going to have to get into God's word. <laughs> Maybe you need some help. We live in a day where help is available. Let me tell you, <laughs> help is available. There, is, there are so many helps out there to help you find things in the Bible. Man, I've got a program I can put any word in. It'll tell me everywhere in the Bible where that word is. That's incredible. It would take me years to do that. In fact, there was one guy who did that. <laughs> uh, Cruden's Concordance, you know, these guys that wrote these concordances out b before computers, you know, they were, they were determined to know God's word, weren't they? Expose every thought to God's word. And three, claim specific principles and commands. Don't just make God's word so general that you never apply it. Uh, I say this all the time, but uh, you know, God's word is kind of like paint. It's no good just in the can. You've got to get it out and splash it around. You know, put it on. Make it specific. Get a verse and apply it. You know, if you're struggling with peace, find some verses in God's word about peace. My peace I give unto you. My peace I leave with you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. You know, there, there's just so many things where, that God has spoken. And God has spoken is the key. And as we let God's word uh, work on our thoughts, you know, you'll have, a, you'll have patterns of thinking that are wrong. And every time that comes up, if you'll apply God's word to it, pretty soon it'll quit poking its head up. <laughs> you know, it's not like that game where you can't hit it. You know? <laughs> it'll, it'll poke its head up, and you'll apply God's word, and it'll, ooh, didn't like that. You know, when Jesus was tempted, what did he use? He used scripture. Jesus didn't just reason with, with Satan. He said, it is written. It is written. And that's the way we need to deal with life. Claim specific principles and commands of God's word. Uh, use the sword of the spirit. It's, it's our only weapon. Everything else is defensive. But God's word is, is our weapon. It's what will help us with the issues of life. Now you can ignore it. You can be ignorant of it. You can, you can, you know, we have a first aid kit out here. You know, you could get hurt and then you could carry the first aid kit under your arm. So, oh, I'm feeling much better now. <laughs> Or you could open it up and use it. <laughs> well, it's the same with God's word. You know, don't just carry it around. Don't put it under your pillow and think it'll ooze into your head. Uh, open it up. Read it. Memorize it. Think about it. Apply it. Talk about it. Now, don't be afraid. God will, God will help you. You know, the world and the devil wants you to keep quiet about God's word. There's even Christians who will get uncomfortable if you bring up godly things and Christian things and Bible things. But don't let that discourage you. God can change our, our thinking. A couple more verses. One, one particularly. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10. This is one of those verses you, you should know that it's in the Bible. You should even have an idea of where it is. Uh, 2 Corinthians 10 verses 4 and 5. He says, The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. That means physical. But mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. See, the world will, will present to you all kinds of carnal weapons. They don't work. <laughs> God's word does. He can help us. He can help us with our patterns, with our thoughts, uh, with, with our life. Uh, one other verse, James chapter 4, uh, a couple of verses, verses 7 through 10. James chapter 4, verse 7. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he'll draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and 
Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. Let me ask you this evening, have, have you drawn nigh to God? Have you submitted uh, to the Lord? Have you humbled yourself before the Lord? You know, when we sin, it, it is a humbling thing, and that's good. Uh, when we feel guilty, you know, that's a, that's a hard thing. But God has a cure for guilt. It's called forgiveness. God has a cure for temptation. It's called the power of his, his word and his Holy Spirit. God will help us. Uh, there is moral freedom. Now, I, I guess in heaven we'll understand it better. We struggle now. But we need to understand there's victory in Jesus. Yeah, there is help. We're going to uh, close with a, a song. It's page 157 in our regular revival hymns. Uh, Jesus paid it all. I thought that would be a good, good song to end it with. Uh, you, know, you know, it's not our payment. It, it's the Lord's. So page 157. Uh, grab a songbook, get Azrael to come and, and lead us in that. <clears throat>